I see people I know. <laughs> um, thank you, Kiki, for introducing everyone. And uh, I guess I will begin. Um, uh, about 12 years ago, um, I published uh, a book of my father's sketches that he did when he was a prisoner of war for, uh, for the Japanese. He uh, did it at great risk to himself, and he had to hide his activities uh, from the guards. Uh, when I published the book, uh, the St. Augustine Record and the uh, Florida Times Union, um, they interviewed me. I guess they interviewed me because I was more or less, more or less known to them because of my, uh, my connection with the Limelight Theater for almost 10 years. <laughs> and I was lucky to play some leads in their plays. And <clears throat> the, uh, because of all this, Flagler College asked me if I would be a speaker at their community lecture uh, series. And they wanted me to talk about my life. And uh, they suggested one hour. And uh, they uh, actually, they produced a flyer very much like the one that Tatum has produced, which is out there. And the, we call the speech Refugee, War Survivor, Actress, and Spy. <laughs> <laughs> and I will be actually speaking in that order. Um, it was uh, suggested to me that perhaps we could stop just before the spy part, um, just for a break. 10 minutes, the bar will be open, there'll be coffee and stretch your legs, and then I can look at my notes and, uh, and then just continue. Now, I guess my life has to start at the beginning. I was born in Harbin in Manchuria. Now, the history of Manchuria is a little bit complicated. Um, at one time, it was Russia. Another time, it was uh, China. Then the Japanese uh, took over, and then it was China again. And uh, I was born to Russian parents who were refugees living in Harbin. So when I was born, I was already a refugee. <laughs> I was. <laughs> stateless and didn't belong to any country. And uh, as a matter of fact, I don't even have a birth certificate. Uh, but the date of my birth was recorded in the baptismal certificate of the Russian Christian Orthodox Church. And my name there, of course, is in Russian, and it's Lyubov Alexandrovna Skvartsova. <laughs> There'll be a test later. <laughs> um, um, now, to give a bit of background, um, my uh, mother's father, actually his roots were from Czechoslovakia. And, uh, but he was born in Russia and then he became a colonel in the uh, Russian cavalry. And uh, he was fighting the Bolsheviks. But unfortunately, he was caught, he was tortured, and uh, killed. And he was only 35 years old when that happened. And uh, from my, my father's side, his father was much more fortunate because he actually was sent to Manchuria when it was Russia. And 
when he was posted there, he was appointed by the Taurus government as the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. But <laughs> his roots were Cossack. A Cossack from the Volga River. And I'm told that I, I had a sister, uh, an older sister. I'm told that when the priest asked her, what's your name? So she told him the name, and then she probably said, and I'm a Cossack. <laughs> Guess what I am. <laughs> um, um, when, when I was born, it's getting, um, Manchuria was actually China. And it was China for three months. In three months' time, Japan attacked. And uh, my father, who was a civil engineer, he relocated us to Shanghai. And uh, in Shanghai, we, uh, the family, enjoyed seven years of uh, a very happy life. It was an international bustling city. By the way, my first languages were Chinese from all the nannies. And then at home, we spoke Russian. And then my parents sent me to uh, a French school at the Convent of the Sacred Heart. Now, at the time, uh, after seven years in Shanghai, Japan attacked. But it, they attacked at the time that my mother, my sister, and I, we, we sailed up to um, Manchuria to visit my grandmother. And uh, when we sailed back, the, the ship anchored in Shanghai Harbor. And uh, I mean, they always did that. But when the power boat was taking us ashore, a Japanese bomber decided to target us, and they bombed us, and uh, the, uh, they missed. And uh, the impact of the bomb in the water just tossed us around just terribly. So my um, father decided it was time to leave. And uh, this time, he, he got a wonderful offer from Hong Kong. And when we went there, Hong Kong was a British colony. So after years of being stateless, we finally became British. Actually, uh, I was British for 17 years of my life. In Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, we had a wonderful, affluent life. Uh, my father built a beautiful house. He actually designed it. And uh, we had an, really an affluent, happy life. And then, Unfortunately, one day, Japan attacked Hong Kong. It, it was just one day, and everything changed. Uh, we were, again, refugees. And this time, not only refugees, but we were homeless most of the time. Japan attacked Hong Kong on December 8, 1941, just a few hours 
after they attacked Pearl Harbor. But for Pearl Harbor, it was the 7th of December, across the date line. Uh, to quote President Roosevelt, it's a day that will live in infamy. Um, about two years before the attack, uh, my father and about 2,000 civilians, they joined the uh, British Army Reserve. And my father joined as an officer. And that group of men were called the Hong Kong Volunteers. Um, the, on the morning of the attack, the Hong Kong volunteers were on the Chinese-Hong Kong border because they were going through their regular exercises. Um, so he was not home. But I was ready to go to school, and suddenly I heard very loud sounds of, of, of thunder. And it was coming from the north. So I ran upstairs, and uh, we had a balcony, a balcony that looked north. And uh, actually, the whole neighborhood was up on a hill. So standing on that balcony and looking out, I had a panoramic view. And as I looked out, I saw about certainly a dozen uh, Japanese aircraft, and they were bombing. And they were bombing Kai Tak Airport. It was verified later. And then as they finished, they started coming towards us. And they kept on bombing. And they came closer and closer. And finally, over us, they didn't hit our house. But they hit the house of our next door neighbors. And, they, and it killed uh, the English couple that lived there. We, <clears throat> we spent that day in an air raid shelter. Um, we knew there was an sh air raid shelter, but nobody ever imagined that we would need to use it. So we spent the day there. And then the Hong Kong government, um, they organized an uh, evacuation of the mainland. We were to leave the mainland, uh, they, the evacuation were for British families and for families of the Hong Kong engineers. In the evening, my father suddenly arrived. And he arrived still in uniform, of course, because he was uh, with the volunteers. And he took us to the uh, post where we were going to be evacuated from the island. And the post was the beautiful Peninsula Hotel, which is right on the shore. And uh, he dropped us off, and he went right back. Because as an engineer, he had to, his duty was to um, blow up bridges, and roads uh, as the mainland was being invaded. Uh, I spent the night in the lobby of this gorgeous hotel. I slept on three chairs, three tall chairs. And then during the night, a man was uh, caught sending um, signals to the aircraft. So they brought him down, and actually they arrested him right next to my makeshift bed. 
the next morning, uh, between the bombing, we were taken uh, to the other side, to Hong Kong Island. And we ended up in a building that was located halfway up the hill. Uh, those of you who have not been to Hong Kong, I don't know if I mentioned it, it's that it is just an island, did I just say that? And it's a big island, there are other islands there too also. And then to the north across a beautiful harbor is the mainland. And that part of the mainland is also Hong Kong. And that's where we live, and that's where we were taken away from. So during the evacuation, between bombing and shelling, they took us to an apartment which was um, halfway up uh, the peak. And we stayed in a building uh, on the second floor. And uh, the building was a five-story building. And uh, in 1941, uh, that building was unusually tall, and it was for a residential area. It was just sticking out there. Um, in this apartment, actually, where we ended up on, it was the second floor of this five-story building. But in the apartment, there were 21 people. Uh, it was a two-bedroom apartment, but it was quite spacious. <laughs> and we spent um, oh, most of the 18 days uh, camping in that apartment. Um, once early in the battle, the battle only lasted 18 days. But early in the battle, uh, the mainland was overrun by Japanese forces. And then they were able to launch attacks on the island of Hong Kong. And the building we were in was on the constant constant artillery shelling. Actually, the building we were in uh, was hit three times. And uh, actually a bomb fell in the hole of that building. The 21 people um, slept in the entrance hall, which was rather large. And we slept like sardines, one after the other. <coughs> we didn't bathe. We didn't remove our clothes. Uh, I think we were able to bathe maybe a week or two after Hong Kong surrendered to the Japanese but we wore the same clothes for a very long time. The apart around the 15th um, day of the war, um, the Hong Kong waterworks were hit. So we had no access to any fresh water. And so we had to survive with no fresh water for three days. There was, outside the building, there was an, um, a pond, an ornate pond, but it was, the water was full of algae. And of course, nobody had bottled of water. Uh, during the day, during these, we, sat when there was shelling, we sat where we slept. Now these, uh, this building 
had two large apartments on either side, and in the middle was the elevator and the <coughs> stairs. And what we did, we sat there, and everyone left their uh, front door wide open to be able to communicate with people coming and going to see what's going on. And one day, I was sitting on uh, a straight chair, and uh, a man suddenly was running up the stairs. Uh, he was very dramatic. He said, oh, oh, you have no idea how bad the, 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 the battle is. And then, I will never forget his words. He said, the volunteers are being killed and their bodies are rolling down the hill. When I heard that, I was so worried about my father that I just fainted right there, dropped to the floor. Um, towards the end of the 18 days, almost, probably the 17th day, suddenly my father appeared. He appeared in a very large open uh, um, car, and uh, it's obviously a convertible. And he ran up, he said, oh, I've heard how bad it is where you are. I've come to take you away. And uh, I, uh, he said, I will try to take as many people as I can. So um, I sat on the back of a back seat while an adult was holding on to my leg. And he was in a hurry, so he said, let's, we, let's go down. So we went down this winding road, and again, I must remind you, 1941, Hong Kong was not a forest of skyscrapers. In fact, uh, the drive was picturesque, and there were beautiful scenes of the harbor, and unfortunately, it was also open to aircraft. So as we started down the hill, a Japanese bomber spotted us. And when he spotted this overcrowded car, he started to strafe us with machine gun fire. He flew very low and he flew three times, and he missed the car each time. The shots were going all around us, but he didn't hit the car. And then my father pulled over, we abandoned the car, and then we ran down the hill, and my father said, let's spread out, spread out, and hide in the bushes. So we all spread out and we hid in the bushes. Finally, uh, the aircraft gave up and we were able to continue. My father drove us down to a large hotel that's no longer there, the uh, Gloucester Hotel, which was very near the harbor. Um, he couldn't wait, he had to go back, and he just dropped us off there, and he left. And what we didn't realize then, it was there that we said goodbye to him, and, and we did not reunite for almost four years. Uh, we went into the hotel, and uh, soon after we heard that Hong Kong 
had surrendered. So we looked out of the window and we could see the Japanese forces crossing the harbor. And we could see them come up on the island. So my mother grabbed me and my sister. My sister was four years older. And we slipped out the back way of the hotel and walked in the side streets trying to find some shelter where we'd be safe. And then while we were walking, she said she knew there were some Ru Russian friends in that area. We walked around and we found them. Actually, someone else also found them. So we went. It's a ground floor apartment. And uh, we stayed there for several days. It was a Russian home, so they had lots of food. <laughs> uh, we stayed there. We did not turn on the lights. and. Uh, the sheer curtains were always closed, but we could see that there were Japanese soldiers all over the street, and they were behaving horribly. Um, they were victorious, so they got drunk. Now, the Japanese do not discipline their soldiers if they are victorious. They can do anything. They can take anything. They can rape. They can do anything, and they're not punished. So those days were really horrible. Uh, people were treated in a dreadful way. Then in uh, a few days, because most of the homes and the businesses were abandoned, so the locals started looting. And there was rampant looting everywhere. And the funny thing is that the Japanese punished those looters. They punished them horribly really horribly. The, what we saw was unbelievable. One day, I was, um, uh, I was in the living room, and uh, suddenly I heard a horrible scream and yell male voices. So I was the nearest one to the window. And I looked through the window, and I could see that there were three Chinese, probably looters. They were on the lawn. This I saw this was on the lawn in front of this uh, apartment maybe uh, 30 or 40 feet away. And there were three Japanese soldiers that were systematically bayoneting them. They, they stabbed their bodies with a fierce yell over and over. And over again, uh, those poor men, <clears throat> they didn't die right away. But when the Japanese soldiers walked away, they left those three bleeding bodies and nobody in our building 
nobody dared to go and help. And those poor men, they were trying to get away and they were dragging their bodies on their stomachs. They were there for quite a while and uh, eventually they weren't moving anymore. Uh, mercifully, they were dead. Uh, around that time, um, we heard that we can cross uh, the harbor, and we, my mother said, oh, wanted to go home. So when we crossed the harbor, on the water, we saw six bloated bodies. They were still floating, but on the land, uh, the Japanese were collecting the dead. Uh, we had to walk all the way from the shore up to our house. We had to go on foot. And uh, we could see how they were collecting all the bodies. Um, I personally saw two trucks just full of dead bodies. And they were obviously just thrown on just every which way. Another thing, the Japanese, I know the Japanese custom is to bow in greeting. But in this case, they wanted, especially foreigners, they wanted us to bow to them. And as we were walking, there was a man who either forgot or didn't bow. So the soldier took him by the neck and just ran his forehead against the pavement. So you bowed. When we approached where we lived, <clears throat> um, and we could see our house already. Um, we lived in an area which is much like Marsh Creek, uh, except uh, the properties were much larger. And as we were approaching, we saw this time five bodies. They were strung up on road signs and their feet about uh, a foot off the ground. Uh, three of them had been uh, tortured so badly that uh, they, they really looked dead. But um, we actually had to walk by to, to get to our house, uh, where two of them, uh, they were still dying. When we got to our house, it had been looted. So the first thing, my mother went to the kitchen or the pantry, and there was no food. At the time of this surprise attack, uh, my mother had just so much cash, and now the banks were closed. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the city was closed. But at the time when we were told to leave the mainland quickly, she grabbed all her jewelry, she put it in the cloth, rolled it up, and she tied it under her bra, so she had some jewelry. And then she would barter for food. 
but that ran out very quickly because one nice gold ring would get you maybe two or three cans of some kind of food. And uh, for us, this was the beginning of uh, hunger. I mean, real hunger. Uh, we were there for I don't know how many months when the commandant of the uh, commandant in charge of all the POW camps, he suddenly paid us a visit. And uh, he came in, he was polite, he came with an interpreter, he looked over the inside of our house, and through the interpreter told us that he wanted our house for his own residence, and we were to move. Uh, my mother, he gave us time, so he didn't throw us out. So my mother with two young daughters knew that she had to leave Hong Kong. And because we have relatives in Shanghai and some good friends, although it was Japanese, it was still livable. So she managed to get a passage <clears throat> in a small Japanese freighter, and we were transported in the hold of the ship. Normally, a trip from Shanghai to, from Hong Kong to Shanghai usually would take three days. But uh, now, the Japanese were afraid of all the mines in the water, so we would hug the coastline all the way to Shanghai. When we got to Shanghai, we spent the rest of the, of the war in Shanghai. It was much better, much better for us. And it was there in Shanghai at uh, the end of August, 1945, that I heard that the war was over. I was, uh, well, first of all, I have to explain that during the Japanese occupation, a short, a short wave radio was against, was not allowed. If you were caught, you would be imprisoned or something worse. So some people would still, still risk it. And once they got some real news, it was whispered all over the city. So at the end of the war, my mother, my sister, and I, we had to live in three different places, in three different homes. And one day, I was walking to visit my mother because of that. And I must have been on a side street or a very quiet street. And uh, as I was walking, as I said, there was no one around. I, I saw a Chinese young man in Western clothes. He seemed to be in a hurry, and uh, he seemed to be excited. And as he approached me, and as he was just about to pass me, he whispered, War! Over! War! No more! 
Finish. No war. Finish. I, I looked at him. And he said, yes, true. Yes, yes, true. And then he was gone. I could hardly take, get my breath. We had been in a state of war for four years. I didn't even know if my father was alive. And, and this young man said it was over. And I began to cry. I cried, I laughed, I cried, and I thought this is a crazy way to behave, but I couldn't help myself. I, I was all alone on the street, and I didn't have anyone to hug and laugh and cry with. I, I will never, I will never forget this. As long as I live, I will never forget this on the streets of Shanghai. Many, many years later, uh, I was living in Beirut, and an airline uh, invited me to go on a inaugural flight over the pole to Tokyo. I didn't want to go to Tokyo, but I accepted because it was a round trip. <laughs> <laughs> and I could stop in Hong Kong. So, on the morning of the flight from Tokyo to Hong Kong, a very nice young Japanese bellhop, he, he took my bags to a waiting taxi. And then when I was inside, he smiled and he bowed like polite Japanese do. And he said, Sayonara. <clears throat> when the taxi left, I wept. After the war, life in Hong Kong was wonderful. Uh, my father, to celebrate uh, the fact that we all survived, he planned a round-the-world trip that was going to take seven months. And he planned it for 1948. It was for my mother and me. My sister was already married. So it was in 1948 that I came to the United States. We traveled in two cars and uh, we, uh, we even went around Canada. And uh, my, uh, when we arrived, my cousin, Art Zukowski, and his parents drove the cars. Art Joukowsky is the cousin who uh, bought the Limelight Theater uh, and his uh, family foundation uh, bought the Limelight Theater and he just gave it to them because I asked him. <laughs> uh, the two of us had our childhood in Shanghai. 
Um, after this round the world trip, I returned to my uh, school in Hong Kong and I passed the, uh, graduated with the Cambridge School Certificate and then I uh, uh, passed the London matriculation, which was for the uh, uh, university. But instead, I talked my parents into um, sending me to London to go to the School of Russian Ballet. And then in New York, I went to the Balanchine School of American Ballet. Then I gave all that up and uh, I went to the, I graduated from the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. And my claim to fame was because my two best friends at the Academy were Elizabeth Montgomery of the Bewitched <laughs> uh, in fame, and then the beautiful actress Sally Kemp. Then I had to get another, I, I had to get a, a job, and I applied at the United Nations in New York. And uh, in the, I, you, I worked with visitors. I used to give briefings in a conference room for, and uh, at the United Nations, there was an upscale sort of restaurant, and uh, visitors could make reservations for a lunch, but they wouldn't take any reservations between the hours of one and two because they wanted available for the busy delegations. So <laughs> one day I was uh, in the lobby and I saw an Englishman who was a tourist and uh, he walked up to a UN guide who happened to be Dutch. And he walked up to her and said, oh, excuse me, uh, do you know where the restroom is? She heard where the restaurant is. <laughs> so she said, oh, do you have a reservation? <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, uh, well, well, you see, the delegates, they have to go between one and two. <laughs> I like that story. I met my first husband at the United Nations. May his soul rest in peace. He left the United Nations and joined the international division of an American steel firm. And when we were married, they sent us to Africa. They sent us to Leopoldville, the Belgian Congo. Today, I mean, today it's not Leopoldville, it's Kinshasa. We spent two years there. I'd love to tell you all about it, it would take an hour. It was really a very interesting place. <laughs> After that, they sent us to South Africa. Uh, in Leopoldville, we lived two years, and in South Africa, we lived five years. And just before we left South Africa, I had my first child, a daughter, and her name is Kiki Toby, and she lives in St. Augustine with her husband, Carl Toby. <laughs> I'm so lucky. <laughs> um, one of the first things we did in uh, South Africa, we decided to go to a gold mine. 
Uh, the tour was very interesting. But then they put you into an, they give you uh, helmets, they give you flashlights, and then they bolt you into elevators that are shaped like a bullet and can only hold six people. You go one mile into the Earth's crust, and it takes time to travel one mile. I don't think I'd do it today. Another thing, I was delighted, I was thrilled, because South Africa had two professional English-speaking theaters, and uh, they hired, they used their own actors, but they also used actors from the London stage. And uh, I auditioned to two plays, and I got a lead in both. <laughs> uh, the first play was The Marriage Go Round, and we played for 10 months. And uh, the theater was sort of an intimate theater, so we played to full houses. And uh, we did uh, eight performances a week. So on Wednesday and Saturday, we do a matinee and then an evening performance. And nothing on Sunday, because the ruling Africana Dutch Reformed Church did not allow any, any entertainment on Sunday. After seven years in Africa, we then were transferred to the Middle East. We were transferred to Beirut, and I lived uh, 11 years in Beirut. Uh, I had another daughter in Beirut. She now lives in Chicago with her husband and two children. I found Beirut, I found it very interesting. It was very different from Johannesburg. In uh, Beirut, you're engulfed with uh, different um, cultures and languages. The uh, three main languages were Arabic, French, and English. Kiki went to a kindergarten which was Arabic and French. And uh, her Lebanese nanny was a, a Christian Maronite Catholic. Actually, the in uh, Beirut, 45% of the population is Christian, and 55 are Muslim. Now, Kiki's uh, Lebanese maid was not at all educated. Although she was not educated, she spoke three languages completely fluently. It may not have been correct, but it was completely fluently. And uh, educated um, Lebanese, they had their favorite expressions in uh, all three languages. And uh, it didn't matter what language they were speaking, they used their, their uh, expression. <coughs> I heard a man saying, jamais, never. Up or down, <laughs> three times. Um, ah, the next thing I'm going to tell you. <laughs> this is I'm going to show off. <laughs> Real showing off. Um, I did not include this part at Flagler College. I'm going to show off how I met King Hussein of Jordan. 
Um, the U.S. ambassador, Robert Barnes, and his wife, they were much older than we were then, but they were very good friends. So when my husband planned a business trip to Jordan, they suggested that we uh, spend a week, um, the end of the week, in Aqaba. Aqaba is at the most southern point of Jordan, and it has a very short shoreline on the Red Sea. And to the west, four miles later, is Israel. And the town in Israel was a lot. So in Aqaba, you could see the lights in the evening of a lot. Now, the drive, we drove all the way, but the drive from uh, Amman, Amman is the capital of Jordan, the drive down was absolutely amazing. You drove for miles and miles and miles of desert, but it wasn't flat desert. There were amazing formations. If you ever have seen the uh, film, the movie Lawrence of Arabia, that's where they filmed it. In Aqaba, uh, there was only one uh, hotel, to my knowledge. And uh, the hotel, oh, <laughs> yeah. I have a microphone here and I'm touching it. Uh, there was just one uh, um, hotel and it was upscale. And it was right on the beach and it looked onto the Red Sea and, and the beach. And along the bottom they had a long veranda and we had dinner on that veranda. After dinner, we just stepped down onto the beach and we sat in very comfortable beach chairs where they would serve you coffee or whatever you wanted. And uh, we noticed, actually there was no one else on the beach. We were the only ones. Everyone else was on the veranda. So we looked to our right and we saw a big dining room table which was right on the beach. And they told me, told us, that was, that's King Hussein and his party. And so <laughs> the ambassador's wife, which is lots of fun, she really was very fun. She said, oh, oh, if he walks by this way, I'm going to introduce you. <laughs> and, and then she said, oh, by the way, Never say you to the king. You must say your majesty. And uh, if you walk away, don't turn your back to him, and so on. I mean, this is 54 years ago, so everything was so formal. Um, sure enough, suddenly that the people at that table all got up and uh, when they rose, everyone on the uh, veranda got up too because the king was there. So he left his guests and he went in our direction with uh, just a small retinue. And as he was approaching, he saw the ambassador and he greeted him. And the ambassador and his wife went up to Hussein and they told us to come. So we walked up and we were introduced and that was 1965. Hussein was 30 years old. He was good looking, he was uh, athletic and very, very gracious. Uh, he was on his second marriage, 
and uh, but that ended in divorce, and she wasn't there. Um, in uh, living in Lebanon, you saw him on the news all the time. He was very popular. He would be. Uh, we saw him parasailing, and he'd be <coughs> flying through the air, and. Uh, uh, he was known to love speed on, in the air and on the ground. So, yours truly, being young and foolish, this is a little embarrassing, I told him, oh, I saw you parasailing and it looks very dangerous. And I said something even more stupid. And I said, Your Majesty, you're a king of a country. You should be more careful. <laughs> <laughs> he was, of course, amused. But I think, in a way, he liked it. So we stood there. And uh, while he, we were standing, everyone on the veranda is standing while we're chatting. And then uh, there was just a few more remarks. And then he turned, Hussein, turned to the ambassador and said, may I join you here? <laughs> and then he dismissed his retinue, rolled up his sleeve, and he sat down with us on the beach. And uh, obviously, obviously he valued this informal meeting with the US ambassador rather than, he met him all the time, but this was informal. We sat there till one o'clock in the morning chatting with him. And then my husband, he had a business appointment that he had to write, uh, which was quite far away. He had to uh, drive quite a distance. So he apologized and said, we really must retire. So the five of us got up, and while we were saying good night, Hussein looks at me and says, do you enjoy the beach early in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> he did not wait for an answer. He said, at 8 o'clock in the morning, I will be on the small beach uh, in my bathing suit. <laughs> so, guess who was up and <laughs> dressed in a bathing suit, hair done, makeup on <laughs> by 8 o'clock in the morning? So, at 8 o'clock in the morning, I uh, strolled down to the small beach. And he was waiting. <laughs> and there was no one else on the beach but two bodyguards. <laughs> there was one on one side and another on the other, sort of discreetly away. And King Hussein and I sat on a small rug on the sand. We sat side by side. He was a perfect gentleman. He was not flirtatious at all. I found him <laughs> charismatic. I really was taken by him. And he was sincere, and he was very natural. And we talked for about an hour, and 
his attention was on every word I said. <coughs> so then at that time, I want to explain, when we came to Aqaba, or when we came to Jordan, we brought Kiki, three years old, and her nanny, her Lebanese nanny. And when I told the nanny that I'm going to the beach to meet King Hussein, <laughs> she just couldn't believe it. She thought I was just crazy. Anyway, at this time, I saw her holding Kiki's hand and slowly appearing on the beach. <laughs> you could see that she was in awe. <laughs> and she was approaching very carefully. And Kiki, she was looking puzzled. She thought, why is a king in a bathing suit? <laughs> and why isn't he wearing his crown? <laughs> anyway, he was very gracious to them. He was so sweet to Kiki. And he was very gracious to the Lebanese nanny. Very sweet. <laughs> Then he said to me, he said, I would like to take my boat out, I guess the Red Sea, and I would like to cruise for about an hour. Will you come with me? I wanted to say yes. <laughs> but I apologized. And I said, I'm leaving Aqaba as soon as my husband arrives from the uh, business meeting. And so he said, I understand. I, I don't know whether it was the desert, or the Red Sea, or having a king. <laughs> but the whole weekend was magical. Oh, how, how my life changed. Amazing things happened to me. I was by now a US citizen recruited by the CIA to be an access agent. Now, how did this all happen? The way it happened was um, my first cousin that I mentioned earlier on uh, in connection with the Limelight Theater, he, his wife Martha, and their three children were posted to Beirut, Lebanon, while we lived there. And uh, because of some uh, family connection in the CIA station, they just happened to know each other. That's how originally he was contacted by them. Um, because of that, they approached him and they said, uh, Art, you speak Russian. Do you know of any female who speaks Russian and would be willing to uh, role play? Because what they needed, that station needed, they were recruit, they were targeting um, KGB officers. But what they needed, they needed a female who would become friends of their wives. Uh, because wives tend to talk and they get to know. <laughs> <laughs> they get to know the character. <laughs> and 
So they said, is there any Russian-speaking uh, person that you might know? He said, well, my cousin Luba lives in Beirut. And as a matter of fact, he's, she's an actress. <laughs> <laughs> so a meeting was planned. A case officer was invited, a CIA case officer was invited to uh, the Zhukovsky apartment. It was a penthouse, it was absolutely beautiful. And that's where the introduction was made. I was there and the CIA case officer who arrived was Ron Estes. <laughs> um, at the, we had a very long, serious meeting the first time because uh, they had to explain to me what they expected from me. So I was there with uh, my cousin, Art, I call him Artie. Uh, I mean, he was like a brother to me, and uh, I told him, I said, look, Artie, I'm a married woman, and I have two young children, and I'm afraid it might be dangerous. So Artie, my cousin, he gave me a little lecture. He said, what have you done for your country? <laughs> he said, it is time to pay back. <laughs> so I agreed. I agreed to cooperate with the CIA as a patriotic American for no pay. Um, let's see. Anyway, so began the, my most interesting role off stage that of a CIA case access agent, access agent. I was briefed in a safe house once a week. Uh, one or two case officers would come and they would teach me what to do and how to do it. <laughs> and uh, every time, oh, first of all, I want to say we, I was trained in a safe house. A safe house is, a, there were many in uh, Beirut, a safe house is a rented apartment on the <coughs> all sorts of fictitious names. When I needed to contact my case officer, now remember this was before we carried cell phones and before the internet. So what they did, they gave me a US Embassy telephone number and they said, ask for Mr. Richardson and you will be told there is no one here by that name. And that would tip off the CIA station that I was calling. And then the case officer would have to go to a public phone somewhere and call me. And then we would arrange a meeting in a safe house. Um, if he told me Wednesday, that would mean Tuesday. If he said three o'clock, that meant two o'clock. 
when I was supposed to go to a new safe house that I didn't know, they told me, park the car in this lot and then watch out. When you see the case officer, follow him into a building, then follow him into an elevator <coughs> and get off one floor above the one he gets off. And then when you get off, you go down the stairs and then he will lead you to the apartment. Now, when Ron was my case officer, he used to like to tease me. Anyone surprised? <laughs> and so one day I followed him. I followed him in a building, I went into an elevator, and the elevator had quite a lot of people, and he was standing by the, the panel with controls, and he was asking everyone, what floor do you want me to punch? And uh, then he looked at me and said, et vous, madame? He knew I had no idea where I was supposed to get off. So I looked at him and I said, Dernier étage, top floor. <laughs> uh, now the CIA, in uh, planning a recruitment, they try to get all the assessment that they can get together about the target. And uh, the way they would do it, they would plant microphones in the home of the target. They would tap the telephone. They would put uh, surveillance on him on the street. And then they would use access agents who actually met them and talked to them. Um, <laughs> then after all the assessments were gathered, it is up to the case officer and the station to decide what is the best way to approach him. Um, <laughs> I have some stories. I'll give you an example. One day I was supposed to be introduced to a Soviet, a KGB officer, and um, I was introduced by another access agent who already knew him. And uh, the other access agent happened to be French national, and he was a professor. Um, in the, in, oh yes, he, he, he was a professor. He knew the KGB case officer, but the wife of the Soviet was in Moscow for a very short time. And then when she came back to Beirut, then I was to befriend her and him, and that's what they wanted. Now, to have me ready for this uh, Soviet, I had to know as much as I could about him. So I would say all the right things. So I was briefed, actually, by two case officers, and they actually showed me a, a thick file on him. I scanned it, and I really knew the man. So on the night when I arrived, uh, I, uh, oh, uh, first of all, I want to tell you that this professor he lived in a very modest apartment in the building on the third floor, and it had a small veranda. And when I arrived, I told the professor, I'm just so sorry, I, my husband had to go out of time. Well, I've already told you that my husband knew nothing about my CIA connection, but in fact, that night, he was out of town. 
So um, the professor uh, had invited a Lebanese lady friend. And so there were just four of us in this modest living room. And it was, we talked a lot. The Soviet actually was lots of fun. He was, uh, he, he loved music and uh, he was a bit of a romantic in spirit. So it was lots of fun. Then the professor, he um, served us dinner. He had the dinner on this tiny balcony for the four of us. So picture this. On a beautiful summer evening, on a small balcony, somewhere in Beirut, four people, three with secrets, dining and socializing. And then, suddenly, the Soviet says, Oh, how nice! What a beautiful evening! And we are all getting along so well. I think, I think that tonight must be a night of confessions. <laughs> <laughs> the professor and I momentarily froze, and then I thought, I, 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 I must respond. So I tried to be very relaxed, and I said, all right, I'll confess. The professor, I saw him. I thought he would have striped kittens. <laughs> he thought that I had lost my mind. But I ignored him and I said, Oh, I think I'll confess. I'll confess that I really did not want to come tonight. I thought that an evening with a stuffy professor and his friends would be boring. But I'm having a wonderful time. Thank you, professor. Thank you for the delicious dinner. <laughs> the professor his color came back. <laughs> I met the wife and the mission succeeded. <laughs> Until then, I was very worried. That's one story. We had lots of little things like that in uh, Lebanon. Um, during 1974 in Beirut, uh, there was a lot of trouble in 1974. And uh, I then moved with my children to Athens, Greece. And uh, fortunately, uh, Ron was transferred to Athens. In Athens, I got a job at the American Embassy at the CIA station, and now I was on, uh, I had my own uh, office, and I was getting paid. I did uh, much the same as before, except I did a lot of transcribing from Russian into English. We had another story, it's worth telling. Uh, 
again, I had to meet and be introduced to a KGB target. And um, I was to be introduced by another access agent who already knew him. And uh, the access agent was an American. And he, um, he was already uh, friends with the Soviet. And actually, he invited him to a very nice restaurant in uh, Athens. And uh, I, the scenario was this. I was supposed to come to the same restaurant with a companion who was another case officer. And uh, when I arrived, uh, let's give him a name, Freddie the other, the American access agent, Freddie. Freddie would be in the cocktail lounge at the restaurant waiting to go to his table. And he would be having a drink with the Soviet. And the point was for me to make a huge fuss uh, about not having seen Freddie in a long time. And because of that, uh, Freddie would say, you must come and join our table. And then the introduction would have been made. So on the appointed day and the appointed time, I arrived at the restaurant with the case officer. And uh, I walked in, and I, uh, Freddie was in this cocktail lounge, and as I walked into the cocktail lounge, I saw, it was a small one at the other end, Freddie was at the bar with two or three men around him. So, in my very best American Academy, drama training, I stepped in, I said, Freddy, I haven't seen you in so long. Where did you get back? And I walked across and I hugged Freddy. While I was hugging him, Freddy whispered in my ear and said, the guy has not arrived. <laughs> so I said, oh, Freddie, what a coincidence. It was an amazing coincidence. I have a magazine in the car that you simply must see. And the case officer and I went out quickly before the Soviet arrived. In the meantime, everyone in this cocktail lounge, they had watched this amazing <laughs> greeting. So the case officer and I, we went out and we went to a kiosk and we bought a magazine. And uh, we were watching the entrance uh, of the restaurant and soon enough, the Soviet arrived. And we decided, let's give him five minutes. So we gave him five minutes. And then we stepped inside and went to the cocktail lounge. And much to the amazement of everyone still in the lounge, I said, Freddie, when did you get back? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we, met, we were invited to join that table, and the introduction was made, and this part of the operation was a success. Ron and I were married twice. <laughs> Uh, the 
first time we were married in the U.S. Ambassador's residence, and the next time was in the uh, Greek Orthodox Church. And uh, the reason for the second marriage was because when I was filling out the application for the wedding, under religion, I put Greek, uh, Russian Orthodox. Well, if you're in Greece and you're Orthodox, you have to be married in a church. <laughs> Ron speaks Greek fluently. And to this day, he tells everyone that he's still explaining my marriage vows to me. <laughs> <laughs> After that, we were sent to Madrid, Spain, where Ron was chief of station, and I was only working part-time. Um, in Madrid at that time, there was a full-face photograph of Ron on the cover of a Spanish magazine, which was called Cambio 16. It was um, uh, like our Newsweek or our Time magazine. It was a weekly news. And uh, it became very dangerous for us, for him. Um, on the cover it said, Ronald Estes, uh, CIA, jefe, chief, chief uh, of station, chief in Spain. Otherwise, um, this whole story has, it's a, it's a story in itself. I, I can't go into the little details, it's just too many things happen. And, um, but I really loved being in Spain for two years. In the mid 80s, when I was back in the States, I worked at uh, CIA headquarters. I was no longer an agent, and uh, I was not a local hire, but I was on board as staff, a staff in operational support. During that time, I possessed three driver's licenses, one for Virginia, one for Maryland, and one for Washington, D.C., all at the same time, all in different names. I also had two credit cards, both in different names. Once, when I was at headquarters, I was sent on a mission uh, back to Africa, to actually Kinshasa, and uh, while I was staying in the hotel, uh, I ran into two Soviet couples. This was not part of my mission, but the Soviet couples decided to target me and to recruit me, not for espionage, but because they knew I could go to the United States and back, they wanted me to join their diamond smuggling ring. <laughs> I had two meetings with them. They were amazing. <laughs> now I have one story, it's the last one. Um, I have to have a sip. It was 1975-76. 
in Greece, there was great unrest. Uh, the chief, uh, the CIA chief, and a really close friend of Ron's, Dick Welch, he was assassinated. Actually, Ron helped the police and the driver to pick his body up from the pavement. Now, the Ron, Ron became chief of station. And because of that, his address and his telephone number was published in most of the Greek newspapers. And practically every day. And he kept on getting threatening phone calls that he would be next, that they would kill him. He got those calls every night. One day, Ron overheard his maid saying, you can't kill him. He's a Christian. <laughs> he has children. And he speaks Greek. <laughs> The Greek government then assigned um, guards to where he lived, and uh, they assigned two bodyguards to be with him all the time. So it was under those conditions that Ron and I were married. From the beginning, when Ron recruited me, he was always teasing me. So I teased him back. I told him one day, you don't know this, but I'm a double agent. <laughs> <laughs> and my Soviet KGB officer, his name is Boris. And when we would have meetings <clears throat> and something sensitive was said, I used to say, oh, Boris will be so interested. <laughs> because of all the threats on Ron's life, and because he was then the chief of station, the ambassador, the US ambassador, asked that we be married in his residence. The ambassador's wife uh, was delighted. She uh, created an altar in the middle of the living room. She got candles and flowers, and she got a running carpet from the altar. And I, um, after this ceremony, a religious ceremony, when the priest announced us as man and wife, we turned away to walk away from the altar, and I raised a small bouquet that I was carrying. I raised it to my mouth, and I said, Boris, mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just want to say one thing before I start. In this job, I was not playing with people's lives. 
we were in the middle of a Cold War, and they were the bad guys. So many suffered from communism in that land of my ancestors. I, I like to think that, that I was a patriot, that in some tiny way that I contributed to the fall of communism. Thank you.